Hey everyone, it's me, John Lord, and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. And I want to thank everyone that commented and watched the first episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. It looks like this is a show format that is really working for you guys, and I'm very happy to do that. So thank you so much for the feedback on this format. Um, this case is Jacob Wetterling, and this is a bit of a strange one for me personally because I was literally just reviewing this case to cover it on Brain Scratch Searchlight. I started looking into it uh, two weeks ago. I'd heard about it from you guys for a long time, but for some reason, about three, four weeks ago, you started asking about it a lot. So I bumped it up the list in terms of my priority for episodes, and I was looking to do it literally this week. Uh, however, I was out on the weekend with some friends, we were at a bar, and on the news it was all over the place that there was a major break in this case. So we're going to talk about that uh, by the time we get to the end of this episode. But before that, we got to start at the beginning. So let's rewind to Sunday, October 22nd, 1989, around 9 p.m., and this is in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Jacob is riding bikes with his younger brother Trevor, their friend Aaron Larson, and they have gone to the Tom Thumb convenience store to rent a movie. Um, if you look, there are tons of different documentaries and segments about this. Um, actually, The Hunt with John Walsh just featured this. Um, well, I don't know if they just featured it. I just caught it on Netflix a few weeks ago. Uh, but you can find it there. Um, and you can see some interviews with his family and you know this was the 80s this is what kids did uh, as a matter of fact this case kind of hits me close because these guys are just a, a year or two younger than me um, and this was something that I would do you know ride your bike to the video store get a movie and, and come home this is just a very typical thing for kids this age to do they were in a group they were um, in what they thought was a safe community doing this and unfortunately they found out it might have not been as safe as they thought. Um, as they were riding home with the movie a man uh, approached them. He was wearing a stocking cap mask uh, and he was carrying a revolver. He forced them to throw their bikes into the ditch and to all lay down. He then asked them their ages um, when Trevor said that he was 10, that's Jacob's younger brother, the man said, uh, told him to run away and said, if you look back, I'll shoot you. Uh, so Trevor ran off. The man then looked at the face of both Jacob and his friend Aaron Larson and told Aaron Larson the same thing, run away, if you look back, I will shoot you. So the two boys run away and unfortunately uh, Jacob is left with this man and taken by him. And that's the last that we hear. The boys that were running away at some point stop and look back and they can see the man is gone, Jacob's gone, they don't know where he is. And of course, Jacob's family finds out that he is missing and this starts a huge manhunt, um, tons and tons of media coverage, not just here in the Minnesota area, but all over the nation. This is honestly one of the most famous um, child abduction cases. However, um, despite some very good things happening around Jacob's memory and in his name, uh, there is no significant progress made on the case until we fast forward many, many years. So about 24 years later or so, there is a blogger named Joy Baker, and she starts looking into this case and writing about it. And she reaches out to someone who thought he might have also been a victim of this same guy. He was approached uh, in, a, in an area not too far from, from this same place where Jacob was abducted. His name is Jared Shearill. Hope I'm saying that right. I, I've heard it pronounced a couple different ways. Uh, Shirel is, is the other way. Um, and nine months prior to Jacob's disappearance, Jared was um, taken by this man and mishandled, I guess, is the most appropriate way to say uh, what happened, and then set free. Now, this man gets in contact with the blogger, um, and this starts raising uh, public awareness around this again. The blogger is basically putting together that there might have been many more boys that were approached and or abused by this man. And some people start speaking up around this. 
Uh, this seems to catch the media's attention and maybe, I'm not really sure, I can't really find some direct correlation here, but I think it's, it seems more than coincidental that around all of this new uh, talking and media exposure that is being generated largely from this blog relooking into this case. It seems like the FBI kind of goes back and says we need to look into this again. Uh, and there is some significant movement that happens around that. July 10th, 2015, they find a DNA match to material that was found uh, on Jared when he was a young man. Uh, and it matches to a man named Daniel Heinrich. Then on July 28th, 2015, they search Daniel Heinrich's house and they find a lot of child pornography. Uh, in August of 2016, Heinrich's attorney basically uh, contacts the FBI and the authorities and says, um, we have a plea deal that we would like to strike about these child porn charges, and this might include a confession to another crime. Then um, on August 29th, 2016, the FBI and Minnesota state authorities meet with the Wetterling family, and they basically tell them about the conditions of uh, what this plea deal entails, that it likely includes a uh, statement from this man about what he did to Jacob, but there is a bit of a twist in all this. This man's looking for a plea deal, so essentially the family has to kind of agree here that they do not want to press charges against this man. Uh, he is looking to get, I think he was taken in with 25 counts of child pornography. They're looking to take that down to one count. Now luckily, just one count of child pornography can result in a 20-year sentence, and this man is currently 53. So even with a 20-year sentence, I think um, there's a very slim chance that he will, he might get out, but he'll be extremely late in life, and there's a chance that he won't get out. Uh, personally, if you take a look at this man, I thought he was in his 60s. So he does not seem to be extremely healthy. So um, him living past the age of 73, I think is, I think there's a reasonable assumption that he might not live past that. But um, basically the Wetterling family has to agree that they are willing to drop essentially the murder charge. Some of the other charges have already run past the statute of limitations for Minnesota. I looked into this um, and it's weird because in some states, uh, sexual charges, particularly against minors, don't expire. There is no statute of limitations. But in particular for Minnesota, based on what I was able to find, it seems like there has been far too much time that has passed for those charges to stick. However, the charge of murder, typically, I think in most, if not all, of the states in the U.S., has no statute of limitations. You can process those cases at any point. I think what the FBI had to consider here, um, possibly what their... Uh, the attorneys that they were working with had to consider here is could they make a case against this man for whatever he did to Jacob? And what would it take to make that case? How much time would it take to make that case? Is the family really interested in seeking justice in that way? Or is it more important to the family to know where Jacob is, to recover him, and to have a proper burial for this kid? So the Wetterling family makes a very, very hard decision there. And on August 31st, 2016, information that came from Daniel Heinrich um, leads to a farm in Painesville where they find a red jacket that belongs to Jacob. Uh, unfortunately, that first day they don't find his remains. However, they search the site for two more days and they eventually do find remains as well as a t-shirt that says Wetterling. Um, despite that evidence that already pretty much points to his identity, they do confirm his dental records and this is indeed the body of Jacob. And you know, I am sometimes critical of confessions and here you have this guy having a vested interest. Hey, I'll give you a confession so that I can get 25 counts taken down to one count. Um, however, this is the type of case where I believe uh, confessions work properly. The man gave them information they did not have before that led directly to the discovery of Jacob. Uh, how do you fake that? You, you, you can't really fake that. Another guy might have said, yeah, 
you know, I did this to Jacob because he was familiar with the story. Um, but in this case, we know that there are facts that came out from this guy's confession that uh, essentially led to the discovery of Jacob. So we know that this is accurate. So um, on September 6, 2016, in court, Daniel Heinrich admits to what he did to Jacob. And if you want, you can look into details. There are many articles being written about this right now. And there's new information kind of coming out, even as I'm filming this. Uh, literally, now there is new information about the search warrants that are being released. There's a lot to look into. Um, but you can pretty much hear Daniel's side of the story, uh, word for word, his account of what he did with Jacob. Uh, you can find that information if you go searching online for it very, fairly easily. So um, the farm that, he was, uh, that Jacob was found on is owned by a man named Doug Voss who lives in Painesville. And just this weird kind of connection, this weird piece of trivia, um, Doug Voss's mother was actually the fourth grade teacher for Daniel Heinrich. It's just, uh, in some ways it's a large world and in some ways it's a very small world. I've got to tell you, my heart definitely goes out to the Wetterling family here. They have done some amazing things to honor Jacob's memory, and I don't foresee that ending anytime soon. Um, I watched a statement from his mother, who of course is very shaken and disturbed um, with what she is facing at this time but I believe that they will continue to do some of the great things that they have done. They've started the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, which is now also known as the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. This is basically getting information out there and exposing families to how can you keep your children safer? How can you avoid something like this happening in your life? Um, there was actually the Jacob Wetterling Act that was passed, which uh, started some statewide sex offender registry uh, here in the Minnesota area as well as a bridge over the Mississippi River near the St. Cloud area called the Bridge of Hope, which is named for Jacob. Um, outside of that, wow, this kind of chokes me up a little bit, but uh, this weekend, um, the Minnesota Twins will be wearing uh, red jerseys with the patch with the number 11, which was Jacob's uh, number, as well as at the University of Minnesota, the Gophers um, mascot will be wearing a red jersey with the number 11 patch as well. So <sighs> that is it. Um, a tragic end to the story, but it seems like some form of justice will be served. And if nothing else, the Wetterling family can um, start that all too important grieving process actually knowing that Jacob has now passed, which is something his mother spoke to, that up until this man making this confession, they still felt that Jacob was alive. And now that they know he's not, they have to deal with that and move forward with that. In one way, it's a blessing because it gets them out of that phase of not knowing, which they've been stuck in for 27 years. It's just a ridiculous amount of time. Um, and hopefully they can heal and find new and different ways to honor the memory of Jacob. So, case cracked and in a very unexpected and maybe unconventional way, but um, I do believe that this is the best outcome for the family. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on Brain Scratch Case Cracked. Very touching story for me, obviously. Um, like I said, there's much that you could look into. I am including a bunch of links in the description box below just to get you started on some of the latest news, but there is literally news still popping out hour by hour um, around this case and more details that will likely shake out. So know that you can continue looking into this on your own if you'd like to. Thanks for spending some time with me. I hope you have an amazing Monday, a great week, and I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord and Arts channel. Take care and stay safe, everybody.